Thank you for joining today's webinar from Yellowstone Advisory. Today's company presenting is Diversified Gas and Oil, who announced their full year results on the 8th of March. It's pleasing to see the consistent delivery again, and there are not many companies in the sector who have announced consistent growth in the dividend over a sustained period of time. While we're just waiting for everyone to arrive, I wondered if you could respond to the poll on your screen. And while you're completing that, I'll just go through a few admin points. The format today is a presentation from the management team, which will last about 30 minutes covering the full year results, and then we'll hand over to Q&A. And you're all currently on listen-only mode, but if you do want to ask a question, please type it into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try and cover all the questions um, at the end of the presentation. Following the meeting, you'll be redirected to a short survey, and it would be really appreciated if you could complete that survey. I think now quite a few people have uh, completed uh, that poll on the screen, so I'm just going to end that. And we've got about 80% of people here today who are uh, shareholders, so great to have uh, so many shareholders with us on this call. Um, now let me introduce uh, today's speakers. We're really pleased to have today Rusty Hudson Jr., the co-founder and chief executive of Diversified Gas and Oil, along with his colleagues, Eric Williams, the CFO, and Brad Gray, the COO. Thanks for joining us all the way from the States. And I'm now gonna hand over to Rusty Hudson to start the presentation. Thank you very much, appreciate it. Um, thanks everyone for uh, joining us, I guess, in the evening hours in London. Um, we're going to walk through a presentation uh, that we uh, put out with our year in numbers. Uh, we'll try to move through it at a quickly through it at, at a fast pace so that we can leave some time for questions at the end. But we will start um, on page five of the presentation and it will be up on the screen. So for those that want to look at it uh, on, on the online uh, 2020. So we're, we're going to talk about it a little bit, talk about the um, the numbers, but really wanted to, to emphasize what a, a, a great outcome 2020 was for Diversified in the midst of some pretty challenging uh, environments, both from a pandemic perspective, also from a commodity price perspective, as we uh, in the U.S. experienced one of the lowest, um, uh, express, saw one of the lowest commodity prices, especially on the natural gas side, that we've seen in some time, uh, probably since the early or late 1990s. So uh, a very challenging environment. Within that environment though, we're gonna talk about some really good uh, outcome as it relates to the numbers. Uh, some of the other milestones that we uh, accomplished in 2020, uh, we released our inaugural sustainability report, um, which was uh, last March. Um, really proud of that. But I think as you see, as we release 2021, you'll see a, a much, even more improved product. Um, and we'll talk more about ESG in a minute. Um, we completed our premium main market listing, uh, moving from AIM, uh, which served us well for over three years. Um, and we moved up last May. Um, we also entered the FTSE 250 index in September of 2020. Um, we also in October announced a partnership with Oak Tree Capital, uh, really as a co-investor uh, to, to invest alongside of us in larger transactions. And we'll get into a little bit more of that uh, in, in the presentation. From a numbers perspective, we had a great year, full year average daily net production of 100,000 BOE per day, up 18% overnight 2019. Uh, the exit rate on an adjusted basis, adjusting it for some temporary downtimes that we saw uh, in December was about 105,000 BOE per day. Uh, again, much larger number than 2019. Uh, and then the smarter asset management continued to make an impact on the production and on the uh, decline rates as we saw our conventional legacy assets continue to stay relatively flat <clears throat> at 69,000 BOE per day. Cash margins, very strong, 54%. And you'll see in our numbers uh, for three years now, we've been able to maintain 50% plus uh, EBITDA margins through a lot of different cash or a lot of different commodity price um, movements and cycles. And that's extremely important. That goes back to our hedge strategy and being able to um, keep near-term pricing out of the picture. And we'll talk more about that in some of the other slides. Cash operating expenses continue to move 
uh, in the right direction on a per MCF basis, which is really how we gauge ourselves from a natural gas perspective to dollar and 15 cents per MCF equivalency, which includes general uh, GNA, uh, which is a very, very low um, operating metric. Uh, we continue to hedge to protect the cash flows. 90% uh, of our production for this the remainder of this year is hedged uh, at a floor of 294 per MCF. 65% uh, of our production in the first half of 22 and really 60% overall in 22 is already hedged and ready to um, at $2.84 average uh, floor, uh, which gives us a lot of, of uh, vision and, and opportunity to um, look at the prices as we go throughout the rest of this year uh, and make some improvements uh, with our hedging going forward in 22 and forward, uh, as we feel like we see a macro uh, event taking place where natural gas prices will continue to get stronger. Uh, the balance sheet continues to stay very strong, 2.2 um, times levered, uh, which is in the range of the two to two and a half times that we talk about uh, in, with adequate liquidity at 213 million at year end. And that has come up even a little bit further uh, since the end of the year. So all in all, a very uh, positive 2020 for diversified. <clears throat> Flipping to page six, talking about the track record since 2017, the strategy keeps delivering. Um, you know, low decline, stable production, which is you know the underpinning, uh, not only of production but of the of the cash flows of the business. We've seen about we we uh, estimate about a seven percent corporate production uh, decline rate as we move as we as we move through. Uh, 2020, um, and that will continue in the 2021 as we use our uh, smarter asset management to offset the declines in the um, in the conventional production, and then we're, we're going to experience probably high single-digit declines in our unconventional production and all in of six to seven percent decline rate. Cash costs continue to make a big difference in the margins, as we you can see since 2016 how we've moved that down uh, over time as we've added scale and size to the company. Uh, the hedging strategy continues to add a lot of value, um, which is, is really, really um, the, the, the emphasis because at the end of the day, that's how we pay the dividend and continue to pay it on a consistent basis. So the hedging strategy has paid off big. Uh, and it also is, we've been able to maintain a very low leverage profile through, through all of the commodity price cycle movements, uh, staying at about 2.2 times net debt to hedge to EBITDA. Um, cash margins, we talked, you can see the three year um, of, of greater than 50%, uh, which is really incredible when you look at the, the industry over the last three years and, and what, it's had, what it's had to endure in terms of pricing and, and commodity price cycles. Uh, and our liquidity right now, 213 million, would, would essentially give us the ability to do transactions that would add 40 to 50 to $60 million, depending on the valuation, 40 to $60 million worth of additional EBITDA. So um, track record has been very good since 2017. <clears throat> the, the strategy, you know, we talk about this all the time, continues to stay consistent. Um, you'll never hear me talking about how near-term gas prices are affecting the business. Uh, we're always hedged out. Uh, we're 90% hedged this year, 60 some percent next year. We're thinking about two and three years down the road when it comes to hedging at all times. Near term gas prices are never impacting the business. Um, we're generating a lot of free cash, <clears throat> free cash flow, the, the free cash flow yield at 25%. Uh, what, what makes it very nice is we don't have a lot of capital expenditures to have to spend that on. Thus, the ability to distribute to our shareholders, and you'll see our, our stated 40% of free cash flow dividend strategy. Uh, the balance sheet, low leverage, keep dry powder for future transactions and future opportunities. The, the, the thing about a, the balance sheet is we, we try to maintain a very strong, low levered balance sheet so that when opportunities present themselves, we're always able uh, to be on, the, on our front foot and able to take, uh, take advantage of those when they present themselves. And you can see how it's paid out over the, over the long haul since the, the IPO and how the shares have performed on a total shareholder return of about 174 percent since since the IPO, and 116 percent since the downturn last year during the COVID last March. So for in a year's time, about 116 percent the recovery in the share price uh, in the return thresholds over that period of time, and and really compares extremely favorably um, to the Nasdaq. Um, 
you know, to our peers in Appalachia, the FTSE 250, and you can see all the different ways that we uh, stack up against the, those. The business model naturally aligns with ESG. Uh, ESG is becoming more and more of a focus, obviously, in the markets, but also here at the uh, Diversified. Uh, the strategy itself lends itself to good ESG. And when you look at the way we acquire assets that are existing production, we don't drill. <clears throat> we, don't, uh, we don't have those emission issues that come with drilling and fracking. Um, and we're taking assets and we're optimizing and producing them and, and keeping new wells from having to be drilled just to cover uh, the, the additional demands uh, on the products. And so our wells, by deploying, deploying the smarter asset management programs and improving the production on the wells, in theory, keeps new wells from having to be drilled. Uh, and then our midstream assets, transporting the gas, getting it to market, um, we, we work these assets, we, we improve them. Uh, we're looking at ways to make them less, um, to, to reduce the emissions um, of the assets as, as time goes by. So all the, our, you know, our whole strategy and our culture is focused on stewardship, which is good ESG. And you can see on the next slide, good, and we, we're starting to pan this phrase, but good, good ESG is good business for DGO. So you can see some of the things that we consider to be very um, effective. Our smarter asset management, optimizing the operations. We talked about how that's reducing fugitive emissions uh, and increasing our asset integrity, protecting the cash flows, paying good wages to our employees from a social perspective, um, compliance with our debt covenants, and then we're safely and systematically retiring wells uh, as they become, become uneconomic, uh, which has been a problem in the U.S. in general because uh, plugging and getting in a, and abandoning these wells, um, not a lot of companies have been doing that responsibly. We are, and it's efficient use of capital. And you can see the governance initiatives that we've done uh, as we've moved throughout uh, 2020, uh, the enterprise risk management, you know, our uh, in, enhance company-wide risk management programs uh, to identify and assess and prioritize risks, uh, the TCFD and the disclosure um, uh, requirements that come there and how we are integrating and, and making that a, a, a big emphasis in our uh, disclosures. Uh, and then the, the, you know, all of our comp now is a large percentage of our comp is linked to ESG, 25% of our executive bonus plans in 2021 versus 10% in 2020. So all these things, as we say, good ESG is good business for us. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Brad to talk some uh, operations highlights, and then I'll come back at the end and talk a little bit about the strategy going forward. Thank you, Rusty. Uh, first thing I'd like to say is thank you to our employees for delivering great results. Anytime we're in front of our investors and we have the opportunity to show appreciation for our, the employees and their efforts, I like to take that opportunity so um, that we, we thought they stayed committed to our strategy and our priorities and produce some terrific results. Um, over the next few slides, we're going to we're going to pull the layers back just a little bit more on some of the highlights that that Rusty uh, shared. And we'll first start with ESG um, and we'll hit each one of these categories from an E perspective. We've historically always had a strong E. Uh, that has been a foundation as a part of our business, as our business model really is uh, a sustainable business model. When we acquire existing assets, wells, pipelines, and compressors, you know, that, that really sets us up for a strong E. So what, we're, what we've highlighted here are our emissions um, uh, data uh, that, that, we're, uh, that we are uh, presenting uh, and reporting on in our annual report and sustainability report. Uh, last year in our, in our inaugural sustainability report, we indicated two things. One is that we, were, that we had reported some very conservative numbers uh, as we were pulling together our different data sets. And the two, during 2020, we would work on um, improving and solidifying our data sets for our emissions information. And we were able to uh, accomplish both of those. Uh, that, along with the benefits of our smarter asset management programs, of, of eliminating compression, uh, repairing leaks, uh, and improving lift techniques, we were able to report a 27% decline in our overall CO2e um, emissions. Uh, that also led into uh, our GHG emissions intensity factor, which is uh, our numerator being the CO2e and our denominator being our production, along with our emissions reductions, as well as the additional volumes that we brought on from our acquisitions, our intensity uh, ratio also declined 
from us from the social aspect of our business, uh, we're very much aligned. Our business strategy is very much aligned with the S category. When we acquire assets, we strive to incorporate the number of employees from the seller and bring them into our family. Uh, we pay, we save jobs with these acquisitions, and we pay competitive to top wages in the areas, as well as provide great benefits. Um, so uh, we, we really empower these new employees to come in, uh, drive success, and to be able to provide for their families. Uh, but our, uh, our social category really starts with safety. It's our number one priority. We were able to reduce our total, total reportable incident rate by 34% while maintaining our ratio of motor vehicle accidents per million miles at a, at a 1.0 times. From a governance perspective, uh, the percent of female board representation has increased from 0% in 2018 to 29% in uh, this past year. And, you, and you'll see in our annual report that our, our board is, uh, is targeting to continue to improve that and increase that percentage as we move forward. Rusty mentioned the executive comp as well, uh, increasing from a 10% performance standpoint up to 25%. <clears throat> What, and, and, and also we, we, we talk about our TCFD framework. Uh, that's gonna be an important part of our business model going forward. Uh, and there'll be more disclosures coming out on that. One other significant government's activity during 2020 was the formalization of our enterprise risk management program. Our board, our board committees and, and our senior leadership um, are highly engaged in our risk management process. Moving on to the next slide, we'll turn our attention uh, to our Smarter Asset Management Program. That is our operating philosophy. Rusty mentioned that. We talk a lot about it. Uh, when we first uh, uh, coined uh, our Smarter Management uh, philosophy, we started with Smarter Well. But our, as our assets have diversified, our asset types have increased, uh, we've changed it to Smarter Asset Management as we look at all operational aspects of the business. Smarter asset management really starts with the empowerment of our employees to create value for their businesses and for their company. And by being successful in creating value for their businesses and their company, we're also clearly creating significant value for our stakeholders. <clears throat> and this, um, this success in driving uh, uh, effectively flat production for the past 10 quarters has generated an additional cash flow of, of what we've calculated to be around $58 million. And so it really is a combination of small, small gains that add up to big wins. And as I mentioned, it really starts with the culture that we've developed to look at all aspects of our business. So it's one thing to talk about uh, programs, brands and priorities, and I'm moving on to the next slide here, but it's, it's much better to really show real world examples, tangible examples of our smarter asset management practices. And on this slide, we've provided three, uh, three examples of how our, our employees, as they've run their businesses, have added value to the company. The first example is what we've called Pennsylvania Pipeline. We acquired, uh, in one of our acquisitions, we had a, a field of wells, 25 different wells that were stranded. They were shut in, they were not producing. Uh, through our diligence efforts, uh, we determined that the, um, the wells were shut in because the pipeline was not connected. Uh, so we, we uh, worked with the pipeline company, we utilized our equipment, our employees, reconnected the pipes, and, and those wells are now producing. Our second example is a similar, uh, similar situation, although, although these were uh, shut in oil wells, uh, they were shut in primarily due to neglect, lack of capital maintenance from the previous operator, and we actually identified this opportunity during our diligence efforts. Um, and so our team put together a plan, executed the plan, same result, a relatively small investment uh, producing some excellent value for all of our stakeholders. Our last example uh, we call Pennsylvania Pump Jack, uh, but this, uh, this one occurred through a very disciplined process that we employ uh, on a daily basis, and that's doing detailed well reviews. And we determined that the historical production uh, of the well uh, was higher than the production that uh, we were currently getting after our acquisition, uh, we changed the equipment on the well and produced a tenfold increase in production. Our last example is, is a uh, what, I, what I really call a win-win-win. Um, when we acquire um, the, uh, assets in, in, 
in the areas that we operate in, we're also bringing over a very experienced workforce. Uh, with this experience and with, with how we cultivate a culture of driving efficiency by using practical solutions, our, our field employees determined that we had a well that was not producing as it should due to salt buildup. Build up. And so we, we employed a, uh, or deployed a, a very simple solution of using vinegar, uh, white vinegar to dislodge the salt, open up the well bore and increase production. So it's a very creative, yet a very cost effective solution um, that was also environmentally friendly. Moving on to the next slide, this is really just showing a visual um, of the increases in our production that we achieved both on an annual basis, as well as a comparative December exit rate. For the year, overall production increased 18%, and for December, December our exit rate increased 10% to 105,000 BOE per day. You can see from the bar charts that this production increase uh, came from both our conventional and our unconventional production. And as Rusty mentioned earlier, the 7% corporate decline rate uh, is a decline rate that we're very proud of, but through our smarter asset management, it's an item that we work on every day with an intention to offset production declines and, and drive additional value. A few additional stats on this slide. Uh, our product mix continues to be 99% natural gas and natural gas liquids. Our year-end reserves increased 7.8% to 607 MMBOE. And our PV10 value, which is only on our PDP uh, reserves, ended the year at 1.9 billion. The next couple of slides are really focused on technology, scale, integration, capability, as well as data, and the value that, that we, we can derive from having this information. So over the last four years, we've integrated 1.7 billion of acquisitions, which was 11 transactions, added over 1,000 employees, um, implemented uh, numerous systems, and loaded millions of rows of data. Uh, we've also invested in and continue to invest in very skilled resources you know, while constantly driving for improvements in our processes and our systems. We are a 100% cloud-based cloud company, which gives us a significant advantage and ability to quickly scale our systems, as well as the ability to standardize our process and our data structures. Um, also, as it relates to the cloud perspective, we were very successful because of the decisions and investments we made back in 2018 and early 19 to be 100% cloud-based. We were very successful and efficient in our systems and connectivity response uh, for our need to work remotely with COVID. So our, really our, our, our systems and our employees did not miss a beat as a res result of that. Mo moving on, um, on this next page, really talking about the, and, and highlighting the importance of our systems and our data. Uh, the amount of data we process is significant and it does require very powerful and efficient tools. As I mentioned earlier, we are 100% cloud-based architecture, um, but we've also um, implemented some very powerful data warehouse technologies uh, and, some, um, and some powerful and efficient analytical tools that we are using uh, to analyze our data. Uh, the, our data warehouse does allow us to drive a consistency of our data attributes and usage from all the different applications that we operate in our business. And as I mentioned, the analytical and reporting tools that we have allow for a much higher speed of analysis than the uh, transactional systems that we use on a daily basis. Um, additionally, our entire network and application layer requires robust security and business continuity processes. Uh, we continue to enhance all of our processes related to security and controls, and we're pleased with the progress our teams made during 2020 on this important part of our business and really all businesses today. I'm gonna wrap up my comments by discussing another very successful year with our asset retirement uh, and plugging programs. Uh, we have um, proactively completed uh, four consent agreements with our top four states where we have the majority of our wells. Those consent agreements require us to plug a minimum of 80 wells per year. During 2020, again, which was a very challenging year due to COVID, just to navigate around, our teams exceeded this requirement and successfully plugged 92 wells. Our average plugging cost continues to be about $25,000 per well, and we spent about $2.4 million uh, during 2020 
on our plugging activities, which was less than 1% of our EBITDA. Uh, also for 2021, uh, we have commissioned uh, an internal plugging team for our West Virginia operations. And we're excited about that, not only what we're gonna learn, uh, but we also believe that's gonna allow us to continue to control our cost for years to come. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Eric Williams, our CFO. Thanks, Brad. Uh, so I'll pick up on page 19, and it, just as a reminder, uh, for any of you who were unable to join our results call yes, or on Monday of this week, uh, we do have that full transcript available and, and recording on our website. Uh, I went through some, some IFRS to, to uh, alternative performance measure numbers uh, in that presentation that you may find helpful, uh, but for this presentation, in the interest of time, I'll stick to the slides, uh, and so we'll pick up on page 19. As Rusty said, you know, we've got a track record now of four years as a public company and demonstrated that a very disciplined strategy works in any price environment and frankly, in the operating environment uh, as we navigated a global pandemic. Uh, and you can see we, we've made that point that the, the, the average price that we saw in 2020 of $2.13 per MMBTU, uh, you had to go all the way back to 1998 and really the early 90s to see uh, prices that were similar. And yet, in spite of that, we, we show that efficiencies and scale allow us to deliver strong results. Uh, $553 million of revenue, inclusive of about $145 million of hedge proceeds, uh, against just $253 million of expenses, uh, allowed us to deliver more than 50% in, uh, in cash margins. Uh, and when you take and you combine that strong cash flow with a low capital intensity business, uh, because our largest CapEx is acquiring the assets, not running the assets and drilling and completing assets, we were able to distribute nearly $200 million of that cash uh, in the form of shareholder distributions and debt repayments, which we'll look a bit more closely at on page 20. You can see that during the year that nearly $200 million splits to $115 million uh, in dividends and share buybacks, so about $100 million of which was dividends to you. Uh, that included the 14% uh, increase through two consecutive increases on the back of the acquisitions we did in the middle of the year. Uh, just reflective of, of the times that we do grow the business through larger step changes, uh, where we ultimately look for an equity infusion, we're always mindful of, in addition for the, the share dilution, that the accretion to the dividend per share is always moving in the right direction. And so to see that, that dividends per share move from two cents a share back in 2017, all the way to 16% per share annualized, 70% compound annual growth rate is really a remarkable achievement. And in addition to the, the dividends and, and share repurchases, we did pay down $82 million of debt. And when you look at our track record since the IPO, and, and we've always been a cash flow focused uh, business, over half a billion dollars returned in those same ways, $287 million back to shareholders and $245 million in, in debt reduction. I'll move on to, we talk about being an efficient organization and, and, and very uh, much focused on our cost. Brad's team does an exceptional job of, of being very mindful that every dollar matters, every unit of production counts, and those two work together uh, to deliver the unit cost that we talk about. Importantly, that base LOE, the bottom uh, portion of the stack, uh, you see contracting 30% uh, from 18 to 19 and a further 24% uh, coming into 2020 and that's just reflective of how focused we are on being very efficient across an ever-growing asset base uh, and, and, and the, uh, the employees that we use to run those wells. When you put everything together, including the midstream assets that we'll talk about in a moment uh, and that the administrative structure that we built to support the organization, you see a 10% compounding reduction year over year in our total cost. Uh, and that's inclusive, inclusive of some, some significant investments that we made in the company. Uh, as Brad talked about, not only in technology that will underpin our future efficiency, uh, but also in good governance that is a premium listed company having moved to the main market in, in uh, May of this year or of last year uh, is, is extremely important to us on a go forward basis. Moving to 22, you know, we talk about scale and what that has afforded us and it really does show up in the margins. Uh, despite a 30% decrease in price uh, from 2018 to 2020, uh, we've been able to maintain consistent margins of 53 to all, increasing all the way to 54%. Despite that challenging price environment, we've done that by using uh, both hedging, 
uh, to protect cash flow and also responsible management of our assets to reduce our expenses. But importantly, if you if you focus on the right hand side of the screen, you know we're encouraged to see natural gas prices beginning to rebound as the as the sentiment around commodities is is meaningfully improved. Uh, the the forward strip is for 21 is 31 percent higher than it was just a year ago, uh, and, and 10 percent higher for 2022. And of course, as Rusty said, we're focused exclusively on 2022 and 23 and beyond uh, to continue to layer in that price protection. Uh, so you will continue to see us build that because ultimately protecting the dividend and protecting our debt repayments will always be a key focus. Moving to 23, it's a new slide and, and you know, I'll move through this one quickly. The gist of it was we get a lot of questions about what our midstream assets do for us uh, because we ultimately believe in vertical integration and what that affords us. So what we've illustrated here by using numbers that you can pull straight from our financial statements is that we effectively are able to uh, deliver the value of a midstream asset at less than half the cost of what we would pay a third party to do it for us. And in addition to that tremendous cost savings, we're afforded several other controlled premium benefits, including the ability to realize higher pricing. Uh, and we can do that by moving our production to better end markets, uh, as well as moving more of our own production uh, as we enlarge the system and we increase the interconnects, moving uh, production off of a third party system onto our system, which allows us to move that production to better pricing. It also affords us flow assurance. So is, is across the entire basin, various portions of the third party system go into scheduled maintenance or perhaps go into unscheduled downtime due to compression or other uh, curtailment issues. We can keep our production flowing by simply changing the direction of where it moves. Uh, it allows us to optimize our expense. And that was rather obvious. I just talked about the fact that uh, if we were to flow this production on someone else's system, it would cost us 50% more to do so. Uh, so not only do we eliminate the cost of the third party, uh, but we also eliminate the third party's uh, inefficiencies because as, as you've heard, our business is focused on the existing assets and producing assets, which allows us to ultimately deliver better uptime and better performance over time. And then importantly, it also diversifies our revenue. Uh, you'll see in the table to the left that we earn over $25 million or earned over $25 million last year in third party revenue. If you annualize that for the additional revenue that we will have on a full year basis from uh, the carbon acquisition uh, that we did mid year, you're looking at around $30 million of, of revenue coming from the, the midstream system, which ultimately allows us to reduce our net expense uh, while having that third party revenue that's very consistent, very durable uh, to complement our, our commodity revenues. Moving to 24, another new slide. And, and the, what we wanted to illustrate here, we'll get a lot of questions because we have been acquisitive. We've been active in the equity markets to raise equity for the larger acquisitions we do. But we felt it was really important to remind that, that to sustain the business and, and live within our means, uh, so that we're not dependent upon either the, the debt or the capital mar equity capital markets for, for the, the sustainability of our business model and our dividend, we wanted to show how that ultimately plays out. And you can see that uh, with the, the benefit of a low corporate decline or a low base decline rate across your assets is that it takes much less cash to ultimately replace and sustain the business model on the go forward. And so we've taken that, that decline We've illustrated that essentially it, it amounts to about 15 BCF a year, uh, which is about $20 million of EBITDA based on our current margins and current cash flow. And if you take that $20 million and you pay the, the, the top end of the multiple that we pay for assets uh, and then lever it at, at two, two and a half times, which is where we've said we're comfortable uh, levering an asset of this type, uh, you can fund that, that production replacement for just $30 million, which equates to just 10% of our EBITDA. And when you think about the allocation of our EBITDA being 40% to dividends and 20% to our scheduled debt amortization, you can see that 10% that's very comfortably and would even allow for, for growth within cash flow uh, if we chose not to do uh, a larger or more transformative acquisition in any given period. Moving on to our capital structure, this is a slide that's familiar, but it includes some, some really important differentiators about diversified. Uh, the first is that 70% of our debt is, sits in fully amortizing, uh, hedged, protected uh, financing structures. And so you can see that glide path over the next 10 years to be uh, completely paid off 
on our long-term fixed borrowings. And when you think about the way, and we talked about that earlier, the way that we the allocate our excess cash flow on a discretionary basis to our RBL, uh, that also is paid off over that period of time. Today, because of the way our debt is structured, the RBL sits at less than one times levered, uh, which allows us to have a very supportive and a very healthy 17-member bank group. Uh, so that as we do look to grow, it gives us that much more added flexibility with respect to the way that we think about uh, uh, financing our, our growth. And very importantly, you know, we've maintained a low cost of financing. Uh, you certainly saw some defensive raises over the last year where companies had to pay significantly higher premiums to get financings completed. Uh, but ultimately, all in, inclusive of our, uh, our long-term and our RBL structures, we're at under 5%, just 4.7% weighted average cost of borrowing. And today, sit at a very com comfortable 2.2 times lever uh, on our assets. I'll wrap up on 26 and just remind, as, as Rusty said, you know, hedging is part of the, the diversified DNA. We're always focused on protecting the downside. We recognize that means that at times we'll give away upside, but when you're locking in uh, north of 50% margins that will allow us to, to maintain our dividend with added clarity for your benefit, maintain our debt and uh, debt repayments and, and delevering, uh, we, we think the trade-off is certainly worthwhile. Uh, very well hedged at 294. When you think back to that cost structure of $1.15, uh, you can see where those margins come from in 2022. Uh, well hedged as well. And if you took that out further, which you can certainly see in our in the footnotes to our financial statements, those long-term uh, financings give us a long-term hedge protection footprint across the, the portfolio for, for about a decade. So we sit very well positioned and, and we will continue to be opportunistic uh, and layer in additional hedging at better pricing as we see the forward strip improve. So with that, I'll hand it back to Rusty. Thanks, Eric. Um, so I'll close up here just with an outlook of how I see Diversified um, performing over the next 12 months and some of the, the strategic things. Partnering with Oak Tree Capital uh, on slide 28, that it's a, um, a big, big opportunity for us, big, big agreement with a large capital provider uh, they've committed up to $1 billion over a three-year period with us to, to co-invest, not equity invest, but co-invest with us as a non-operated working interest partner, 50-50 uh, on deals of size, $250 million or more. Um, and as part of that, they will promote us. 52.5% of the economics on a going forward basis would come to us as a 5% promote. Uh, and then a, a reversion. So after they hit a 10% stated internal rate of return, they'll revert. 15% of their interest back to us, which would then leave us with a 60-40 split in the asset. Uh, it's very strategic. Um, it, the biggest um, positive for me in this deal was that it gave credibility to our strategy. They, a large capital provider that, that was looking to do the same thing we were doing uh, and saw an opportunity to partner with somebody who was already doing it and doing it well. Um, you know, The other thing that it, it does for us is it gives us an inventory of assets uh, that we already operate, that at any point in the future, we can uh, accelerate the reversion or we can buy back additional interest on top of that. So it's, a, it's an inventory of a billion dollars worth of assets that we can then acquire at some point in the future once our stock price is at a level where we don't mind raising equity or we have liquidity on hand to take advantage of it. So it's a big, um, big opportunity for us to, to partner with someone with a lot of capital. Uh, strategic priorities, uh, as we look out, uh, over 2021, they really don't change. Um, you know, sustainability initiatives, ESG is a big, big um, uh, opportunity for us to continue to improve and to monitor and to uh, show improvement year over year. We're going to have another sustainability report, which will be out in the next uh, month or so, um, that will be, that I believe will even be better than the first one. Um, and we'll have some additional uh, disclosures in there that will around the TCFD and, and such. Uh, we'll continue to maintain our uh, growth strategy in a very disciplined manner, uh, maintaining our balance sheet strength, uh, not over levering. As I've told over and over again, we'll never um, risk the balance sheet just for the sake of growth. Uh, we'll continue to protect future cash flows with our hedging strategy, um, and, but also from a pr production perspective, um, you know, really focusing on the operations of the business and really, um, you know, tightening up and making uh, improvements along the way. You know, as we've grown the business, now it's really just focused on, on, on operations and maintaining uh, every unit of production we possibly can. 
all of these will continue to be very strategic priorities for us as we move throughout 21. And then lastly here, just stating some of the obvious for us, but um, you know, why invest in diversified? And you, you know, we, we continue to show stable cash flows. We've done it now for four years. We've done what we said we would do. Um, we've paid our shareholders a very reliable and stable dividend and actually a growing dividend. Uh, we continue to integrate our operations and provide low cost structure, which has really been the, the emphasis and allowing us to uh, operate at such high margins, keeping our balance sheet strong, uh, underpinned by low leverage, hedging our, our production, keeping our declines in check um, by maintaining a very flat production profile in our conventional uh, production uh, and keeping our unconventional production in the mature state, not acquiring two uh, assets which have high declines, um, and then just the low capital intensity of our owned assets. All these things really provide for a very stable business, a very strong business, uh, and as you, know, as you have seen uh, on our previous uh, uh, slides, a return on equity focused business. So with that, I will uh, stop the comments and open up, I believe, for some questions. That's great. Thank you very much, Rusty. Um, and uh, many congratulations on, a, on an excellent performance in a, in, in a tough year. As you said, we're now going to go over to uh, questions uh, from the audience. We've had a, a couple ahead of time. And just as a reminder, if you do want to ask a question, there's a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Just type it into that and uh, we'll try and cover as many questions uh, as we can in the time available. First one, uh, just a, a straightforward one on the cash margin. Where can the, the cash margin get to, or um, is 54% as, as good as it gets? Well, I think there's a balance. You know, we have to look at, you know, when you look at our cost structure and getting down around $1.15 for MCF, which includes GNA, by the way. Um, we can't cut too much. You've got to keep reinvesting back into the into the business. And so we're comfortable in that cost of $115 to $120. Uh, the margins, if we maintain a 50 to 55% EBITDA margin, we're going to be very successful as a company. So we're very comfortable in that range. You know, could we get above that possibly as we add some, you know, unconventional production at very low operating costs, but we're very comfortable with the margins that we're currently uh, experiencing. Okay. Got a couple of questions here on acquisitions and I'm going to ask them together because I think they come together. So the first one is what kind of acquisitions uh, can we expect? And then uh, secondly, it said on the acquisition strategy, you know, who are the seller of, of, of uh, assets at, at these gas prices? You know, what do you do um, to persuade them to sell? Um, and if you look at the, the, the I guess, the, the deals are coming ahead, how are they going to be split between um, diversified involvement and um, Oak Tree's involvement? Yeah, well, I think, you know, the acquisition market is pretty, um, it's robust, but there's a lot of different types of assets for sale. So there's a lot of development assets that are out there in the market, which obviously doesn't fit our profile at all. We, we, we try to stay away from development projects. We don't want, you know, to be on the drill bit. Uh, so we're very selective. Um, and so we're focused on the PDP ones and the ones that have a profile of asset that looks a lot like ours. Um, the market is, is, is pretty good right now. And we're, we're evaluating things. Um, you know, I think that if you looked at the transactions that we're going to enter into uh, in the near term, potentially, uh, those would be, you know, deals that could be done without Oak Tree's involvement, but not necessarily that they won't be involved because we can, we can involve them in any transaction, uh, regardless of the size. Uh, we're only required to show them everything over 250 million. Um, but I would, ex I would, ex uh, I would venture to say that the, the billion dollars that Oak Tree has committed to us, um, there won't be a problem making a large dent in that, uh, in 2021. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll be out there. We'll be active. The, the acquisition market will be, uh, robust, but we'll be selective. We want to make sure we're not overpaying. We want to make sure we're getting the assets that we feel like fit the best profile but also have the, the, the best value and long-term value to our shareholders. Sounds like you're going to be uh, quite busy. Just a, a linked question on the, the Oak Tree tie-up. Now that you have that, um, does that mean you're considering a dual uh, US listing? 
Well, I don't think there's any intention on doing that anytime soon. Uh, but the intention obviously is to to move into the U.S. markets at some point in some manner, whether that's a dual listing or if it's a full listing. Um, you know, I think we need, as I've stated on various calls, we need to be bigger. We need to be two billion dollars or more in market cap. Uh, so it's going to take some bigger deals uh, over the next 12 to 24 months to get us in a position to be able to take advantage of that that opportunity. Okay. Moving on to the uh, operations and the and the assets that you've got, could you try and explain uh, the reserve profile a little bit? Um, how many years reserves left do you have at the current volumes um, if you exclude acquisitions? Well, I'll let Brad pipe up on this a little bit, but I mean, our reserve base is 60 plus years of reserve. So uh, the type of assets that we operate just have a very long and extended life. Uh, Appalachia probably has the longest and lowest decline type assets in the country. Um, so most of these assets will long outlive everybody that's on this phone right now. Um, but the way we operate those, it, you, you have to operate them in an economic uh, way because they're not big producers individually. And so the smarter asset management comes into play to extend those lives and to give them a, a much more longer and enduring life. Well, I'll just add to it, and, and um, Rusty mentioned this on the acquisition strategy, but as you've seen, we've, we've grown production, but we're also growing reserves. And so we're replacing our reserves through the acquisition. Eric walked through a, an example on the cash flow side. Well, the reserves follow with that. Um, so we do have a, a very long life, uh, and, and our task uh, is to arrest that decline as much as possible. Okay, thank you. Um, here's a question, which I think is a good question here. What, what are the biggest risks um, that Diversified faces over the next three to five years? And are you concerned about President Biden's policy focus on renewables? Uh, no, not really on, on the Biden question. You know, I think that, um, I don't think it's just Biden. I think renewables are of emphasis everywhere. Uh, but it, definitely in the US, it's going to be more of an emphasis than it was previous. Um, but I do think that anybody who thinks that, you know, natural gas for sure is not part of that equation is just fooling themselves. It's too much of our power grid. It's too much of our chemical uh, supply. It's, it's, you know, LNG, all these things that are taken into consideration, there's renewables can't replace it in a very short period of time. Um, and I, and, you know, honestly, I think oil is going to be, a much more part of the equation going forward than what people think. Um, so, you know, I think that overall the regulatory environment will be a little harder and, and to deal with as we move forward, mostly from pipelines and federal lands, drilling on federal lands. Um, but the one thing I think people are not really focused on is that these regulations come at a cost. And what you're seeing in oil prices and, and other things, you're going to see prices move up for these commodities as a result of these kind of regulations and, and, and a focus on renewables. Okay. Going back again to the to the assets and the acquisitions, are there sizable areas of the Marcellus or the Utica plays where PDP reserves have reached a point in their decline profile where they fit your acquisition model? Yes. Um, and, and you know we are all, 30 percent of our production today is in those in those types of assets. So it's not something that's new to us, um, but what we are is, is discussing these kind of packages with, with operators. Once they hit that three to five year, um, you know, mature state where they're in terms of their uh, production profiles, that's when we're interested. When they hit three to five years of age, that's when we'll start to take a look. That's when the, the decline rates start to marginalize where they can be managed uh, much, much better. Excellent. We've got a question here on the dividend, and I know the dividend's been, uh, um, you know, growing very nicely since you since you floated, and it's clearly important to a lot of UK investors. So, the, the diversified dividends remitted to the UK are subject to a US withholding tax, and this means that I guess tax-free pension funds and ISAs in the UK have difficulty reclaiming these amounts, and this does not encourage investment by overseas pension funds and other tax-shielded investors. Is there any way that Diversified can help mitigate these withholding amounts? 
Area. Well, importantly, the, the pension funds are eligible for 0% withholding, but that has to be achieved at the, the custodian or the, the uh, beneficial holder level. And so, uh, it, you know, my suggestion would be to work with your, your broker to make sure that you're holding behind one of the funds that's claiming that. Uh, because we do have a meaningful number of investors who qualify for and receive 0% withholding on those. Um, there's a UK-US tax treaty that, that affords you, I believe it's a 15% withholding as opposed to 30% uh, if you're holding with a broker who makes that election and files that the appropriate paperwork. Um, and then for anyone who is paying 30, it's an important reminder that, um, and, and I would advise you to, of course, consult with your own tax professional, but uh, it's certainly our understanding that you should be able to, to claim a foreign tax credit on your return to receive back the value of any excess withholding over which you would otherwise pay on a typical dividend uh, in your ordinary course. And so uh, th that's how we ultimately have navigated it. But uh, but that generally sits more at the broker level than at the corporate level. OK, thank you. Um do you intend to maintain your acquisition focus on uh, in Appalachia? Or will you look at long-lived, low-decline gas or oil assets in other basins? Yeah, well, we'll continue to look in Appalachia for sure. Everything we do there from here on is bolt on. It's very uh, synergistic. Uh, we get a lot of cost saves out of it. Uh, so we'll continue to, to be our primary focus. We'll continue to be Appalachia. But the size of the company now, the scale of the company gives us, you know, we've built a um, a very nice and significant backroom operation that, that allows us and affords us the opportunity to add continual, continually add additional uh, assets to that portfolio. Uh, and we, so we're looking outside of Appalachia also. And so we can look at some areas of the country that fit our asset profile, longer life, low decline, uh, places where we can scale up like we've done in Appalachia and build a, a similar type operating structure in that region. And so those are the areas we're focused on, but Appalachia will always be the primary focus. Right. Um, and in terms of acquisitions, would you consider acquiring more midstream assets? If they're, if they're um, in some way or, or another tied to our existing upstream business, um, then yes. Would we go out and just acquire a midstream asset just to be acquiring it without any of our production flowing through it? No, uh, it would have to be something that um, fits well with our existing upstream assets. But yes, if it if it has that type of um, you know ability to to flow our gas through it, whether it already does or it has the ability to, then yes, we would we would definitely look at it. Okay. There are a lot of happy shareholders over here and uh, um, the TSR performance that you reported was was very strong, but we always want a little bit more. So it's a question here that says that the stellar performance still seems to fail to be reflected in the in the share price. Um, while the strong flow of dividends is very welcome. Um, what do you think the share? Well, why do you think the share price has not risen to bring the dividend yield in line with competitor or compar competitor businesses? Well, I think in the last month or so, up until the last couple of days, actually, but most, you know, we had seen a pretty, um, pretty steep rise in the share price. And I thought when you're trading at levels of six and a half times EV to EBITDA and your, and your dividend has come down to eight, eight and a half percent, you're starting to get priced pretty close to where you think you should be. We're always going to have to pay a dividend that's a little higher than Exxon or Shell or BP simply got because on a risk adjusted basis, if we're if we're both trading at the same dividend yield, most people, most funds are going to go into those larger in their in their minds, less risky companies. But, you know, an 8 percent dividend yield, 7, 8 percent is really where we should be trading in terms of the dividend yield. And so we were almost down to that level here not too long ago. Over the last couple of days, we've seen a little bit of a downtick in the in the share price. But um, I think if you look at us based on our U.S. yield play uh, stocks, we're still trading under those. Um, most of those are trading at some level of what seven, eight percent, seven to ten, yeah, yeah, seven to ten times EV to EBITDA, uh, and we're trading at six to six and a half. So we've got. I think if you're comparing us to U.S., we've got some room to move up. Um, but if you're just looking at it in terms of just purely a, on the dividend yield, I think we're starting to get around to close to where we should be. 
Um, although I think right now with this downtick the last couple of days is a really, really good buying opportunity. I've just got one further question here um, that's coming on, on email. Are there any future potential liabilities once you have retired a well or, do, or are all liabilities removed at that point? Well, the good news is, is once you plug and, and, and sign off, the, the state sign off on the well, it, all liability is, is released at that point. So you've plugged it, the state signs off that you've done it properly and safely. Um, they sign off on the, I think it's a, like a permit or yeah. some type of sign off and then that's it, you're done. That's great. Uh, there aren't any further questions at the moment. Um, so uh, unless any come in in the, in the next uh, second or two, this brings us to the end of today's webinar with uh, Diversified Gas and Oil. Thank you very much everyone for attending. Um, as you leave, you will come to a short survey. So we'd very much appreciate it if you could um, uh, complete that. If you've got any questions that haven't been answered and wanted to send them through, please send them through to uh, info at yellowstoneadvisory.com. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you very much for attending and, uh, and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate thank you. it.